42. Community and Airship We have seen the relationship of communion to community and of inheritance to redemption and the relationship of both to God's law. In the name of the law and in the name of obedience to God, men have regularly destroyed community and inheritance and have made rebellion against God of virtue. An illustration of this from the rabbinical tradition is most explicit. Rabbinical enactments were prohibitions called gezerot, decrees and regulations of a positive character called takanot, ordinances. With respect to gezerot, one of the maxims of the men of the Great Assembly was make offence for the Torah, avot 1-1, that is, protect the laws by a hedge of prohibitions more stringent than the latter. A warrant for this was found in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 30, interpreted as, Make an injunction additional to my injunction. Moed Katon 5a, Sifra Ahare, following 86d, Editor Vice 247. The explicit prohibition of Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, nor shall ye take aught from it, was easily got over by reliance upon Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 8 to 11, where implicit confidence in the courts of each generation and obedience to them are prescribed. Thus, paradoxical as it may seem, the rabbis believed that it was their right and duty to make changes in the biblical law if imperatively required, while maintaining nevertheless that the commands of the Torah were unchangeable and might not be added to or diminished. When the exigencies of the time seemed to demand it, the rabbis in council or individually did not hesitate to suspend or set aside laws in the Pentateuch on their own authority, without exegetical subterfuges or pretense of mosaic tradition. Where justification was offered for extraordinary liberties of this kind, Psalm 119 verse 126 was frequently quoted with a peculiar interpretation. Instead of, It is time for the Lord to do something, for they have made void thy Torah, the verse was taken to signify, It is time to do something for the Lord, so make void thy Torah. That is, there are times when to abrogate a law is to do something for the law as a whole. There are rabbinical enactments from all periods which are more or less at variance with the plain letter and intent of Scripture. Compare first door, 50 to 52. Judaism has been more honest than Christianity in its pragmatism and in its departures from Scripture. The churches have been less faithful to the law, or as unfaithful, but also less honest about it. The rabbinical quote-unquote right to set aside the law when the exigencies of the time seemed to demand was in essence the old pagan pragmatic principle. Rome expressed it thus, The health of the people is the highest law. Such a principle is the triumph of humanism. Antinomian churches deny God's law while claiming salvation in terms of this same humanism. It means securing, quote-unquote, benefits from God without any obedience to him. Man's salvation, the health of the people, is made the true and only law. Sin is thus rebelling or revolution against God, affirmation of man's right as against God's right, and man's law as against God's law. By means of sin, Man seeks to bless himself apart from God's law. The goal of sin is to further man's claim to be his own God, to establish his own dominion and sovereignty, and to bless himself according to his own counsel of predestination. By means of sin, man seeks to make himself his own heir. 
By dishonest means, he seeks wealth. By lawless sexuality, he seeks to heighten his sexual pleasure and sensations. By false witness, he seeks to promote his own welfare, and so on. By every sin, he hopes to bless himself. What is true of the individual is also true of society and the state. The state has instituted a number of godless forms of taxation, the property tax, the inheritance tax, the income tax, and so on and on. Status taxation is revolution against God. Its purpose is to supplant God's order with man's order. The function of God's tax, the tithe, and God's ordained civil tax, the poll tax, and limited fines, is to establish God's order. Status taxation is revolution against God, but this does not justify a tax revolt, which only compounds humanism. Neither Christ nor the apostles faced as they were with the exactions of Judea and Rome, both far worse than modern states in their godless policies, ever gave any ground for a tax revolt against Herod, Nero or anyone else. God's kingdom is not established nor furthered by lawlessness, but by God's law and obedience thereto. It is rare to find a tax revolt advocate who tithes. Tithing creates a new order. The tax revolt adds anarchy to existing evils. How is God's order to be established, if not by faith and obedience? To praise God requires obeying him. This is clear in Psalm 146. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, while I praise the Lord, I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth truth for ever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign for ever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Commentators, who often manifest all the marks of a eunuch, tend to see this psalm as so much holy burbling, and they miss its relevance to man's everyday duties. The psalmist first stirs himself and others to the praise of God, and this praise means faith and obedience, trust and service. Men are prone to trust that which is immediate and obvious, namely the state or princes, verses 1-4. to four. They look to the state for help. They praise and serve the states with their mind and substance. There is neither safety nor help in man who is both sinful and mortal. He is a creature of God made from the earth and destined to return to it. Our trust, rather, should be in the Lord who made heaven and earth and all things which are in them. The government of all things is in his hands and absolute power. Verses 5 and 6. Second, the government of God is then specified in its concern for the unjustly oppressed, the unjustly imprisoned, the hungry and needy, those who are in spiritual and physical blindness or darkness, the bowed down, the aliens, the widows and orphans, and all who cry for justice. The purpose of God is to relieve, or better, restore these people to their rightful estate and to deflect and frustrate the plans of the wicked. Verses 7 to 10. Third, how does God do these things? Do men sit back and serve the oppressed? It's no concern of mine. 
God will work a miracle for them. Or does not God work a miracle of redemption in us so that we might apply his law to every aspect of life? It does not seem to occur to commentators that we have here a series of references to God's law, to his requirements of us in our societies. Let us cite some of these laws. 1. Relief for the oppressed. Jeremiah chapter 22 verse 17. Micah chapter 2 verse 2. Verse 8 following. Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 6 and 9. Acts chapter 20 verse 33, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3, Colossians chapter 3 verse 5, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, Galatians chapter 5 verse 21, Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 27, Ezekiel chapter 22 verses 12 and 29, Isaiah chapter 33 verse 1, Exodus chapter 20 verse 17, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 21, Proverbs chapter 22 verse 22, Leviticus chapter 19 verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 18, Psalm 94 verse 20, Ezekiel 45 verse 8, Proverbs chapter 16 verse 12, etc. 2. Relief for the hungry. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 17. 18, verses 32 to 37. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 7 to 10. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 16. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9. Exodus chapter 23, verses 6 and 7. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 35 to 43. 3. Relief for Prisoners Leviticus chapter 19 verse 15 Matthew chapter 25 verses 35 to 36 Psalm 79 verse 11 102 verse 20 4. Relief for the Blind Leviticus chapter 19 verse 14 Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 18 Job chapter 29 verse 15 Isaiah chapter 9 verse 10. 5. Relief for the strangers. Exodus chapter 21 verses 21 to 24. Chapter 23 verse 9. Leviticus chapter 19 verses 33 and 34. Exodus chapter 12 verse 49. Leviticus chapter 24 verse 22. Numbers chapter 9 verse 14 chapter 15, verse 15 and 16, Acts, chapter 10, verse 34, Romans, chapter 2, verse 11, Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 9, Colossians, chapter 3, verse 25, First Peter, chapter 1, verse 17, Ezekiel, chapter 22, verses 7 and 29, Zechariah, chapter 7, verse 19, Malachi, chapter 3, verse 5. 6. Relief for Widows and Orphans Exodus chapter 22 verses 21 to 24 Leviticus chapter 19 verses 33 and 34 Malachi chapter 3 verse 5 Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17 James chapter 1 verse 27 Zechariah chapter 7 verse 10 Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 7 1 Timothy Chapter 5, verses 3, 4, and 16. God is to be praised because his kingdom and law order are concerned with the needy and the oppressed of the earth, and God is to be praised by ministering to those whom God commands us to care for as a necessary part of our obedience to and praise of him. The Tax Revolt advocates forget that God makes all things work together for good in terms of his purpose. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 Even the iniquitous income tax of the United States has an important function in God's sight. At a time when antinomianism has undermined the tithe, the income tax deductions granted to religious and charitable gifts 
has kept untold millions of dollars flowing into godly agencies to keep Christian work alive. There is no questioning the impact of this legal situation shortly before the tax year ends and people face tax payments. Gifts to such agencies abound. In a time of indifference and antinomianism, God has used an ungodly tax to further incentives towards the support of his kingdom. To read Psalm 146 without an awareness of what it means to praise God is evil. To praise man, princes or the state means to administer a status program for the relief of human need by means of dishonest taxation which is in principle revolution against God. A fat and corrupt welfare bureaucracy is created and an evil mob of welfare recipients because from start to finish there is a necessary consistency. An evil tree bears evil fruit. Matthew chapter 7 verse 17 Psalm 146 makes clear that the praise of God requires obedience to his law. It means inheriting responsibilities under God and also receiving blessings. To follow the contrary course of the welfare state is to disinherit ourselves from God and to make ourselves heirs of man, heirs of the state. The state, however, is not God. It cannot create, nor in any sovereign sense govern. As a result, to maintain its power, it must, like Cronos or Saturn of old, devour its children or heirs continually. To be heirs of the state is to be heirs of destruction, but to be heirs of God in Christ is to be heirs of regeneration, life and the glories of all creation. To be heirs here and now involves very clearly a concern for the people of God, for the strangers, the needy and the oppressed, in terms of God's requirements in his law. Inheritance should not isolate us. It should establish us more fully in Christ's kingdom and community.